From BaseNet Internet Television, we present show number nine of As We See It. Welcome, everybody, to season number two of As We See It. I'm Ed Jupin, along with Fred Boaz, who will be joining us momentarily. Before we get started, I just want to do a little housekeeping here and bring everybody up to date. We're glad to have you all back. Uh, we had a nice little group that followed us during show, uh, or season one, rather, of As We See It. And... Um, a lot of good, interesting things are going to be coming up. Uh, we are shortly going to be turning this podcast into a video program. So just as you watch all of our other video shows on BaseNet Internet Television, you'll, within the next few weeks, be able to watch this show as video also. Just a little contact information. Uh, back last year during our first season of the show, we had um, a fairly good number of listeners and we had several people that really followed us and interacted with us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we will shortly be using Google Plus also as soon as Google Plus opens up to brands, which they haven't done yet. It's still in beta. But if anybody wants to get into the conversation with us when we're off the air and really help turn this into an interactive two-way show, you can reach us on Facebook at BaseNet. So just go to facebook.com slash BaseNet and follow us there. For Twitter, we're BaseNet TV. So twitter.com slash BaseNet TV. And as soon as we're up and running on Google+, we'll of course also give you that information. We are also, for our video uh, version of As We See It, currently looking for advertisers and sponsors. If you're interested in gaining more information on becoming an advertiser or sponsor with us for As We See It, or for any of the other BaseNet Internet Television programming, drop us an email at marketing at basenetintermedia.com, and we'll be glad to get back to you and discuss that with you. So without any further ado, I'll turn this over to the host of the show, Fred Boaz. Welcome back, Fred, to season two. Hey, thanks, Ed. Appreciate it. It's been a real, real, real good time. Uh, unfortunately, we had to take the break, but that's okay. Like you said, we're going to be going video in a couple of weeks, and that should be exciting. We'll actually be able to see what we look like, which I don't know if that makes oh, people no, that's off. that's pretty scary. Wait till, wait, be... wait till everybody – well, actually, I was going to say wait till everybody sees the lobster on television, ah, well, but everybody's already used to the lobster. It's us uh, that they're not used to. Well, Speaking uh, of well, the lobster, what's going on with that? I hear he might be joining us. He maybe – Former – or not the former. It's moving to St. Louis, but the uh, the co-host of Holly and the Lobster. What's this all about? He's going to be joining us at several shows from the Boston area. Also, uh, Holly, Hunt, uh, Holly Hurley did move to uh, the St. Louis area to host her. Uh, and she'll be hosting a new show that we have called About about St. Louis. And she'll be joining us as well, along with Jessica Moskowitz and the entire BaseNet uh, Internet Television team when we can get a hold of them. And should be should be some interesting stuff going on there. Good. Uh, before you get things started, um, we're going to continue what we did back in season number one with naming an executive producer of every show. Normally, the executive producer will be the person or persons that give us topics that they would like to see us cover on a particular upcoming show. Well, since this is our first show back and nobody has had the opportunity to uh, give us suggestions for this show since we kind of started out of the blue on people. Um, I just want to thank three people who have been following BaseNet Internet Television um, as a whole, not just necessarily this show. And they've been very actively following us on Facebook and all, joining in on the conversations there and all. Uh, one of which happens to be, I'll have to give the disclaimer, an employee of Based on that internet television. Our, yeah, I know I'm following you. Oh, oh not our, me, not our me, not me. marketing consultant, uh, Lawrence Ignacic. Um, for all of the hard work that Lawrence is putting in to BaseNet, we're naming him an executive producer of this show, along with two of our longtime listeners and followers, Cheryl Page and um, Randy Portnoy, Portnoy Zeff, um, who are both very actively always commenting on Facebook posts and everything that BaseNet does in general, um, and specifically as we see it. So thank you to our three executive producers for following us and for all of the effort you put into being a great fan and or employee of our company. So Fred, uh, let's get moving. 
Yeah. Okay. Like, uh, and again, I want to thank these three people, especially and our and our our listeners who are out there listening to us right now, and thank them for tuning in and listening to the ramblings of an idiot. Anyway, um, I want to discuss uh, an issue that's been going on uh, that's been be hitting the news and the, and uh, newspapers and stuff like that for a while. It's the uh, situation over at the postal service. These guys are claiming they are going to be going are going to be hitting the fist at the end of the fiscal year in September. Uh, about $9 billion in the hole. And people are screaming about it. Congress is screaming about it. Nobody's, asked, nobody's addressing the issue or telling people where it's coming from. And I have some, I have some information on that. And, you know, the people well, – a senator recently made the statement he didn't know the Postal Service was not funded by Congress and it was a self, self-funding agency, and it is. Except for mailings, the Postal Service gets no money from Congress. Everything they do is based on revenue. And the post service as we know it now was formed 40 years ago in 1970 from the old post office department becoming the postal service and it, it mandated to be, self, to be self-sufficient. And up until fiscal, the end of fiscal year 2005, which ended September 30, 2005, they made a profit every year. And it's important to understand that since 2006, they haven't made a profit. They've been $8 billion in the hole. That $8 billion – well, you got to ask yourself what happened in 2006. What they, happened? Well, they, the yeah, U.S. Congress in 2006 signed something called the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, and what that basically does, to make it short, is it uh, charges the Postal Service with pre-funding retiree health care 100% to the cost of eight billion dollars. That split between the two retirement systems, the Federal Employee Retirement System and Civil Service. Because as of, 19, as of eight, 1987, Postal Service employees are no longer Civil Service employees. That $8 billion comes out at the end of the fiscal year to pre-fund, and they're not going to make it this year. And it's unfortunate. So, you know, and even with the president giving them three months extra to pay, it, they still don't have the money. So they're cutting, and, slashing, and, cutting. And what we've seen... Um, is this is the postmaster general who has come out in all of the uh, press releases I've seen, and Basenet has actually posted some of these up on Facebook and Twitter and so on and so forth, um, that the postmaster general is saying that by first there were rumors they were saying over the winter we're going to be broke, and then he finally came out and made a statement, and he said, no, it's actually going to be next summer. He said, but by next summer... We don't know if we could continue the way we're currently continuing. And they really can't. And when it, when you, if you take that, that $8 billion was created because the Postal Service in itself is a cash cow. People use it. You're using it. You're mailing me, uh, you mail me something from, from the office, from base that office to my office, and it's going to be there tomorrow. I mean, two days from Boston. I mean, that, that's terrific. And it's relatively inexpensive. It's cheap. And, it, you know, I'm able to track it online. I love it. And so. And- What's what's really I was thinking about this earlier today. What's really inexpensive is just a first class stamp, which That's forty four cents. Okay, I was going to have to play stupid and ignorant because I just never really use it, um, and that might that's be part that, of the that's problem. Probably part of the problem. But here we go, forty four cents. What I was thinking of, I'm only in my fifties. When I was a kid, ah, back when I was a kid, a stamp was yeah, five. Back, back in the good old days, a stamp was five cents. But by saying I'm in my 50s, you know, I had to preface it with that because we're not talking really ancient history. You know, we're talking when I was a kid, so let's say 40 years ago. 40 years ago, a first stamp uh, stamp was a nickel. So over the course of 40 years, it's only gone up from 5 cents to 44 cents. Look at what the price of gas or other expenses have gone up over the course of that same 40 years. Oh, absolutely. And the thing that gets me, and what do you get for your 44 cents? You send a letter from, and in our case, Boston to Pennsylvania. If I move, it gets forwarded for up to a year mm-hmm. for, for the same price. There's no extra, there's no extra charge. If, you know, it, 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 it's a, it's, it's, a, it's almost, it's almost virtually free that once you pay for that 44 cents, you're not getting charged anything more. Right. And. That's there's also no extra surcharges for Saturday delivery like UPS does and FedEx does, and these guys, the gang over there, they're doing a hell of a job over there, six days a week. And part of what the postal service wanted wants to do is they want to drop Saturday delivery. But only get back to the eight billion dollars. Yep. If you take that eight billion dollars off the postal service's burden, they're making money. 
and they're making money in a in a in a down economy because people still use the postal service. There's nothing like getting not like getting a card in the mail. Or in our case, you're sending me something. It's UPS is expensive for a lot of this stuff. Oh, it, you know, it, and, UPS probably would have cost me not triple, but at least double of what well, it cost me with USPS. USPS, you sent a priority mail delivery confirmation costs five dollars and sixty five cents postage with the confirmation. For that same size parcel, it would have been ten, fifteen dollars, and it yeah, wouldn't have taken. It would have been days. double, right? And I would have been well. That piece that I sent out the other day mm-hmm. that went to FedEx, yeah. it took a week to get there. See, a week to get from here to California. If I had been, if they had sent me a UP, a US mailer, a US Postal Service mailer, it would yeah. take it three days. Right. But they use FedEx, and and I'm not putting down FedEx and UPS. Don't get me wrong, but. For that same eight, you know, that eight billion dollars was targeted at the postal service as a cash cow because it's called the Postal and uh, Accountability and Enhancement Act, not the Government Enhancement Act, the Postal, and it's killing these guys. I mean, the Postmaster General is talking about closing on Saturdays. He's not really talking about closing on Saturdays. He's talking about no, uh, no major deliveries on Saturdays. Right. Abbreviated deliveries, possibly for express mail. Priority windows, mail. Window service, maybe? Window service, windows, abbreviated window service. I mean, most windows are already open until noon anyway on Saturday okay, at 1 right. o'clock. How much more are you going to cut? Okay, it, right. but if you cut those salaries, those carriers on the road, and you wear and tear those vehicles, you can save a lot of money. And UPS and FedEx don't do it now, and they don't, they're not interested in Saturday work. Right. They look at they look at the post service like they're idiots. Why are you going out the six days a week? So Mrs. McMurphy can get her newspaper? Right. Well, you know something? I went and picked up my mail. This morning and today's Sunday because I was too lazy to get out and pick it up yesterday while I was off. Mm-hmm. So, you know, nobody needs their mail that much. Seven to five days a week, people can adapt, and it'll make things easier. And I mean, they'll save millions of dollars and won't have to. And you, you know, know, we'll we'll get back to the comment you made about me being part of the problem when I said I don't really use first class mail anymore. So. Just as I don't use first class mail anymore, I'm certainly not the only one because like you said, I'm part of the problem. So I've adapted. Um, For all I care, uh, home delivery could get cut to three days and it's not going to matter to me because I still subscribe to a couple of print magazines, uh, the, the few that I don't already get in a digital format, but I subscribe to a couple of dig, uh, print magazines, and then every now and then you get something by first class mail. So if it even went down to three days a week, it wouldn't affect me, and a lot of people must feel that way. No, they don't feel that way, but in reality, when you go and you go and you see what the guys deliver to a house, you'll see one one magazine – one letter and one circular. Now, yeah. Now, is it necessary to you know to see out every you, day? For what that? if you came in? They delivered Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I can deliver Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I have no problem. As far as deliveries, they come in five days. You come in Monday, or maybe or maybe have them there six days a week. Have them come in Monday, deliver Tuesday. Come in Wednesday, deliver Thursday. You know. Or whatever situation, or three days a week, because these guys are full-time employees. But you have them come in and, case, and, and get the mail prepped on one day, prep the mail on the second day, and deliver it. And get mail three days a week wouldn't affect me at all. I don't really care. I mean, and it's and most people, when if they if they if they had to, could get used to it. Businesses are going to complain. Well, you know, if you get your checks three days a week, you know something, it isn't going to affect your business if you don't get the check today. For mm-hmm. most companies, I mean, if you're running that tight. And you got a problem. I mean, you should be running that tight in, in a business anyway. I mean, sometimes you do, but for the most part, they don't. And these, and they, and, and these people, are, you know, they, 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 these guys are hurting. People think the Postal Service employees make a lot of money. They don't make they, – they make a lot less than UPS. They're not, they're, not, they're not part of the same union, and they don't have the same representation. And everything they do is mandated by Congress. The Congress, who all they're interested in is votes. They're interested in showing how they can reduce the federal budget, and they're not – telling people the truth and that's what we do here based on internet, based on internet television because we well that's how we see it so and and if anybody wants to comment on this subject we just put up a post on facebook uh about should mail delivery be cut to maybe no more mail on saturdays or even cut down to monday wednesday and friday which now the saturday uh cut is something that's on the table monday wednesday and friday we don't want to intimate that 
that was suggested. It has not been. That was something we just tossed out there as a hypothetical. What if it was cut down to just Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? But uh, get to us at facebook.com slash spacenet, and you could look for that posting and send us your comments on that, and we could certainly follow up on this again in the future. Oh, we'd love, we'd love, we'd really we'd, you know, we want to hear we want to hear from all of our people. Now you know there's there's a lot that goes up on Facebook that go and, and, and that's a lot of nonsense. But we're trying to get people involved in every venue out there. All right, let's turn the tide here a little bit and let's talk tech a little bit, even though we haven't really talked tech on the show before. Why not? Uh, there's this an article in uh, dated September 18th. 2011 okay. from Inc. Magazine. December 18th, 2011? September 18th, oh, okay. 2011 from Inc. Magazine by Kurt Finch and Rene Riccio. Uh, are the tablet wars over? Right. And uh, they say in this article that um, it's not just their opinion, it's pretty much out there that yes, they are, and Apple's iPad is definitely the victor. Um, been a lot of casualties lately. Uh, Rims, Playbook, still out there being sold and I would imagine being manufactured, but it's uh, doing nothing. Uh, they've only sold less than a, um, like less than 250,000, like less than right, right, right. a quarter of a million over the past quarter or something. Uh, and that was a, fore, it was a foregone conclusion though, that Apple would win. Well, no, because you you had all of these other so-called iPad killers that were coming out and just can't do it. You know, and if, if we look at this statistic where RIM's playbook sold just over 200,000 playbooks or so in the last quarter, Apple sold over 9 million iPads. Yeah, right, right. Uh, you know, not even oh. close. Uh, my son, my, my stepson got that. Uh, we bought him a new uh, new Motorola Zoom. I was telling uh, Zoom. I was telling you about. I love that thing, man. Well, that's it's running great. Android, correct? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. running Android. Well, that's that's a problem with the playbook. It's not. Um, but even Android. Um, well, let's see some stats here. Well, Sharp has scaled back its tablet offerings uh, in Japan, anyway. And then right, the right, right. Here, uh, they've cut back to only a seven-inch model. They've pulled its ten-inch model. Really. Yep, because Apple is beating the pants off of all other tablet options in Japan. So says this article in Inc. Magazine. And uh, They seem to know what they're talking about. And you remember a couple of weeks ago that Hewlett Packard said that they were going to pull out of, pull their touchpad off of the market. Right, right, right. And that was only out in the market for one or two months, and they're already pulling it. Yeah, I mean, Apple's, Apple's got to be – and what gets me is about Apple killing these guys is that the, the Zoom cost me 500 and change dollars for a uh, – See, that, a, 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 that I love, and Apple's 1500 bucks. Oh, no, not an iPad. iPad's 500 bucks. Oh, really? So, okay. yeah, so see, now, if that's, – that's a problem. If a Zoom costs $500 and you could get an iPad for $500, you're going to get the iPad. Um, is I mean, I'm an Android person personally. Oh, yeah. I'd much rather have an iPad than a uh, Android tablet. Uh, they they just got it right. Apple Apple got it right. That's why they own the market. Um, I wasn't aware that the Zoom is the same price as the. Well, we paid five hundred something dollars at one you, of the. You, in my opinion, as I see it, you would have been better off with the iPad for that kind of. I didn't know, yeah, well, we were in the. You know. Um. If I had known the price was that different, I didn't see the iPad at all when I was out there. Yeah. Uh, and then getting back to this article, uh, the iPad owns 66% of the tablet market. The Android tablets trail way behind it, only 27%. Which is a lot more than everybody else did. Well, yeah, and the other ones are so far back that they can't get any traction at all. So, you know, um, competition is good. I certainly believe in competition. I don't want to see the iPad as the only tablet out there. But iPad won the tablet war. I, I would agree with that. Okay, what about phones? Who do you think is winning the phone wars? Uh, just, that's just the opposite. It's, it's not who's winning. It, who, it's also who won. Android is so far ahead of the iPhone worldwide. Android phones are the biggest seller worldwide. Um, they're... Uh, <laughs> 
activating, that's the word I was stumbling Right, for. right, right. They're activating over 300,000 units a day on the Android. And the thing is, people, and people that know our company know that I'm always always the last one in the company to step up to the plate, and, and even I'm getting an Android. So, you know, it, it is what it is. And, you know, it's all be, albeit however we're doing it, but it's the idea that, this thing, that these things are so far advanced I'm looking at the Android uh, tablet my son's got. I'm looking at the Android phones of people around me, and I'm taking the BlackBerry and just tossing it because it just doesn't it just doesn't do it anymore. I mean, they've got and we have discussed this for ten or fifteen years, you and I. Uh, See, and, 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 and you and, and, and you we get got to the BlackBerry. Rim Rim tried. They oh, have no. a couple different touch touch screen phones out there, and all which are all inferior to iPhones or any Android phone. Um, they were just too late to the game. And just couldn't cut it. And they don't, for the fantastic products that Rim had out for over 10 years. And we used them. They sure did. They just, they were just too late getting to the game and they had an inferior product or still have an inferior product that people just weren't interested in. Anymore. No. Because, you know, it doesn't you, compete. And you have to, yeah, and you have to, you have to lay in that codicil that you and I, and, you know, as part, for years ago before BaseNet was accepted, we had, you know, the businesses we had, the production companies, we all had it. We had, we had, 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 had Blackberries and all the new stuff all the time. That was the state of the art. And once you, once Android came out, it, it, it's, so much different, so much faster, so much smoother. You can do more. We had discussed this ten years ago, you and I, yep. that if they that, that we 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 were dreaming about these phones ten years ago, and they finally came out. That's right. And even I'm, I mean, and even I'm going uh, with Androids, which you know, I mean, once I go Android, the whole world goes Android. But I mean, the idea is that it, it is, you know, it it's the, the the it's the wave of the future. Absolutely. And people. You know, and and you know, yeah, and and I want to tell people if you know if you're looking for an Android phone. These things are expensive. Let's let's you know, let's let's call a spade a spade. But you can find deals out there. I mean, Ed, you just found a deal. Yeah, no, the deals are out there. And the deals are out there for quality merchandise. I mean, the phone you picked up, and I'm not going to get, get into your thing. I'm not going to get into how much, but you picked it up for about half the price, and things brand new. Sure. I mean, virtually brand new. So you have a phone that you wanted. For half the price of what it costs, of what it would normally cost, or less than half the price now, and they're easy to activate. They, you know, they they sync onto everything you're doing. I mean, this is this is fantastic, and it's something that they should have come out years ago, and that they had, you know. I mean, and unfortunately, Rim, you know, sorry, gang, but you're done as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Okay, so what are we going to do over the next few weeks? What time types of uh, subjects are we looking at? Oh well, first of all, we're looking for we're looking for our our, our uh, mainstay of people to, to kind of show us what they want to know about. But we're gonna be checking the news and see. I'm gonna be following up on the postal service, see what they're doing as far as uh, check what they got. You're gonna, I know you're gonna be doing the tech news and keeping uh, keeping up with that. I'd like to bring Larry on, you know, Larry well, Lobster on to uh, for, you know, for 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 his for his scope on on what's going around on around the nation. Larry has a few ideas. His his main lead story is in Brookline, Massachusetts. Um, a resident there is going in front of the town council, so to speak, whatever they yeah. call it in Brookline, well, yeah. and um, wants to ban the Pledge of Allegiance from being said in the public schools. And the discussion is that the town of Brookline is looking along the lines of a compromise of making the pledge voluntary, not mandatory. So I'm not going to steal his thunder, but that's one of the subjects that Larry's looking to discuss. Oh, yeah. Uh, Larry has a number of other pet peeves. And, uh, this is the place to air them. He's going to be bringing them up. And... So we have a lot of good things coming up shortly. Oh, and we look forward to hearing from everybody on our stuff because, I mean, this kind of stuff is, we, you know we're going to have opinions on this one. And last the last season, we would close our show with a, uh, an announcement of an obituary or a uh, timely event that occurred during the week. And this week, we lost a, uh, a jazz great blues man, Willie Big Eyes Smith died in Chicago at 75 years old. He was a, a longtime side man for Muddy Waters. He died of a stroke in Chicago, and he's gonna be he's gonna be sorely missed. He's one of the great ones from the uh, blues era. Sure. 
So, all right. So, does that about uh, is that how we see it for this week? That's how our, we see it for this week. Our show number nine, which is our first show of the 2012 season, uh, soon to become a video program here on BaseNet internet television yeah uh what do we have a couple more weeks we anticipate of being an audio podcast yet yeah probably, probably about two or three weeks okay so in about two or three weeks i guess we're going to start off with larry the lobster joining us and uh he'll be discussing this uh situation with possibly banning the um Pledge or of Allegiance alter, or altering in massachusetts or altering it anyway so let's see what happens with that and um uh, Many There's other things. Letters. And great. So anybody that wants to partake of our two-way conversation, as we said, we put up a post on Facebook already about uh, your ideas on the Postal right. Service cutting down its uh, home delivery to five days or less per week. You could go to facebook.com slash basenet to respond to that. You could also reach out to us on Twitter at twitter.com slash basenet tv or you could email any of your ideas and comments to us at info at basenetintermedia.com and that'll get to us and if you're looking to become a sponsor or advertiser on this or any of our other basenet programming and we are offering a couple of really good deals on advertising right now if you happen to have a business or know somebody that has a business uh, our marketing coordinator, marketing manager, Lawrence Ignacic, has come up with a great opening package for us. Basically, we're offering pretty much a 50% discount of what our advertising rates are normally going to be. It's a one-time offer. Deal. Oh, tell me about it. It's a one-time offer. It'll only be available for a short period of time, but it could get you in as a base net advertiser at a, at a roughly 50% discounted rate. And... Um, could be locked into something good so that's how you could see us oh and for the advertising you could contact us at marketing at basenetintermedia.com so marketing at basenetintermedia.com info at <laughs> basenetintermedia.com on facebook we're basenet on twitter we're basenet tv and i'm bed jupin at the studios of basenet internet television that's how i see it I'm Fred Boaz, and I'm at the offices based on Internet Television in Swiftwater, Pennsylvania, and that's how I see it. Have a nice week. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.